Before I get into the next story, I just had something I wanted to say. Of course, I want to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed and every good comment that I get. Sometimes I get some negative ones, but those are still views, and I still appreciate everyone who takes the time out to view my videos and um, leave feedback. I also just want to say I find these stories online and I find information on any websites that I can find. I go on different missing murdered persons pages on Facebook, Reddit, Web Sleuths. There's many others out there. I don't have any resources at my hands other than the internet. Um, if someone comments on a post on Facebook or on a YouTube video or something like that, I will mention to them that I have this channel and ask if they're interested in my doing a video on their story or the story of, of their missing or murdered loved one. I reach out to them or sometimes I've had a few people reach out to me. If someone shows that they're not really interested, that they don't really want to discuss it, then I leave that alone. I don't pursue it. My channel is just um, to inform people about these missing persons, these murder persons, these unsolved cases. It's just to discuss it and to give my opinions about it. And um, Before I do get into this next story, I did want to do a couple of follow-ups. Uh, Faith Ward, the little girl, the 13-year-old girl who had driven her mother's car and parked it somewhere in Nashville right before Christmas. I think it was Christmas Eve, actually. She has been found. She's been located and returned home to her family. As far as I know, she was safe. I didn't hear any details. There was nothing posted out there as far as where she had been or who she had been with. I don't know if any charges had been brought against any adult who may have been, you know, she may have gone off with uh, or had been staying with. I don't know any of the details, but I do know that she has been returned home. Katie Massey, Katie White, the girl that was reported missing last seen in Moorhead, Kentucky, back in November. Her car was spotted and located in Oklahoma City. As far as I know, there has been no follow-up on her. Uh, there is a missing persons poster finally has been put out, but it wasn't put out, as far as I know, by the Center for Missing Persons. It was put out by a group of people who uh, try to help in these cases. Um, there are some TikTok videos about her. There has been no update. I do not know if she has returned home or if she's contacted her family or anything. I know that I hope that her family is able to find her and contact her and that she does return home. Jacob Fox was a young man who was reported missing in um, Beattyville, Kentucky. I did a story on him a while back. Now, this was posted about a week ago. He's still missing. Jacob Fox went missing in Lee County, Kentucky on July the 1st, 2023. His grandmother made a link to a Facebook page asking for his whereabouts or if anyone has any information. Someone did make a comment on the video that I made about him and said that they believe that he had become the victim of a serial killer in that area. I haven't found anything about that. But unless I can find, if someone comes and says, that here's what happened to that person, or if someone sends me an email and says, here's what happened, unless I can find proof of that online, or if I can find other resources that um, verifies that, I, I can't. Uh, the only thing I can do is say this is a theory. This is information that someone believes may have happened. And there's going to be times when I'm not going to post certain 
comments or things because it could lead to um, misinformation, you know? Like I said, I only make these videos. Um, I don't have a crew of people working with me. I make these videos myself. This story is a little similar to uh, the boy in the box case. This is a strange, unusual story that I came across. Um, this happened in 1921. And I found this on a website called Morbidology. On March 8, 1921, the battered body of a young boy aged 5 to 7 was discovered floating in a pond in Waukesha, Wisconsin. He had been bludgeoned to death before being dumped in the pond. Theories are that he could have been in the pond for a number of months before he was discovered. He was wearing expensive clothing which indicated that he may have come from an affluent background. Despite coming from a seemingly wealthy background, nobody ever claimed his body. He was put on display at a local funeral home, and a $1,000 reward was offered to anyone who could identify him. But no one came forward with any information, and his true identity was never known. Why he was brutally murdered is still a mystery. Little Lord Fauntleroy, as he became known, is still a mystery. Now, they think that he um, came from an affluent family because he was dressed in clothing that would have been worn by children from families, um, you know, at that time who had money. They believe that he died sometime in the autumn of 1920 to early February of 1921. He died from blunt force trauma, and he is buried in the Prairie Home Cemetery in Waukesha, Wisconsin. He was three foot tall and six inches, three foot six inches tall. Um, on March the 8th, 1921, the remains of the boy were found floating in a pond near the O'Loughlin Stone Company in Waukesha. Authorities estimated he was between the ages of five and seven. He had blonde hair, brown eyes, and had a tooth missing from his lower jaw. He had been struck with a blunt instrument. He was dressed in a gray sweater, Munsing underwear, black stockings, a blouse, and patent leather shoes. Police displayed his body at a local funeral home, hoping that someone would come forward to identify him. No one did, and the boy was buried in March of 1921. My question is, today, a hundred years later, we have DNA technology, we have genome sequencing where they can, you know, test. He may have cousins three times over out there in the world um, that maybe would link this child's, you know, genealogy. And I wonder if they've, if they've done that or if they plan to. An employee of the O'Loughlin Company said he had been approached by a couple five weeks before the body was found. The woman wore a red sweater and asked if they had seen a little boy in the area. She was reportedly crying. The man accompanying her was seen watching the area where the child was located. They later left in a Ford vehicle, and no one ever saw them again. A possible scenario for the case is that the little boy may have been abducted from a wealthy family in another location and disposed of somewhere where his identi where it would prevent him from being identified. After the investigation stopped, money was raised by a local woman named Minnie Conrad. She raised the money to be able to bury the child. She was buried in the same cemetery in 1940 after she died at the age of 73. People wonder if maybe she was related to the child in some way, 
um, and just wanted to make sure that the child got buried properly. There was a sighting of a woman who came wearing a heavy veil, and she would occasionally come to the boy's grave and place flowers. Some speculated that this was actually the woman knew the child, maybe even possibly the child's mother. People speculated that a little boy named Homer LeMay was actually the little boy. In 1949, a medical examiner from Milwaukee suggested that investigators felt there may be a connection between the unidentified boy and Homer LeMay, a six-year-old child who disappeared around the same time the child died. LeMay now his father, what they're saying here is Edmund, his father, said that his child, Homer LeMay, died in a vehicle accident during a trip to South America. He was being cared for by a family friend, but there was no existing record of his death. Edmund LeMay stated that he learned of his son's death after receiving information from a South American newspaper. He was also accused of falsifying his wife's signature while she was missing. But he was later found not guilty of this. Detectives were unable to find any information about any event, such as a, an accident, or even these family friends who were supposedly caring for the child. This is dated 2021. Middle America, a, a hundred years ago, was confronted with a tragic mystery, the discovery of a dead young boy in a quarry pond. Besides its expensive clothing, the police couldn't determine anything about his identity. He was very dapperly dressed, such as you might see characters in children's books from that time period. No one came forward to claim him or to claim to know who he was. They, they believe that he probably wasn't from that area. If he had been, surely someone in the area would have seen the child. But keep in mind, he was only determined to be around five years old. He probably hadn't started school yet and maybe had been kept at home with his mother most of the time to where people wouldn't have seen him. On Monday, March 8, 1921, an employee of the O'Loughlin Stone Company was walking along a quarry pond when he made the ghastly discovery. He saw a small he saw a small body floating in the pond and rushed back to the office to get help. He contacted the Waukesha County Sheriff Clarence Keebler. Keebler contacted the coroner, and the two of the men drove to the quarry pond. County officers collaborated with the Milwaukee Police Department to conduct a wide search of the area. He did not appear to be malnourished and bore no physical marks of abuse on his body. But what most captured the police attention was the way he was dressed. The small boy had been dressed in a blouse and a button-up shirt, a gray sweater from an expensive brand, black stockings, and patent leather shoes. This, this was high quality clothing at that time and was worn by children of families who, you know, were considered to be well-to-do, I guess. Newspapers reported the finding of the mysterious dead child the boy was dubbed Little Lord Fauntleroy from a lavish character featured in a popular book at the time by Francis Hogston Burnett. Investigators could only guess at how long the child had been in the pond, and they estimated between less than a week and six months. Today they would probably be able to tell in an attempt to gather information, they put him on display at a local funeral home and invited the public to come by and view the body. While groups came by to view, no one came forward with any information. 
until a quarry worker named Mike Coker, he would be among the first to give the police a lead into the boy's identity. He informed them that he had witnessed a young woman in a red sweater wandering around the pond about a month earlier before the child's body was found. Coker added that when he questioned her about what she was doing out there around this quarry pond, she anxiously asked him had he seen a little boy in the neighborhood. Coker added that the woman in red then joined a man and they drove away in a Ford car. Now keep in mind this was 1921 and not a lot of people had cars. People for money probably had cars. The couple was never located, but the authorities did receive a tip that the woman had died by suicide in that very same pond where the boy had been found. They proceeded to set off dynamite in the water in hopes that the explosion would bring the body to the surface. Despite their best efforts, the police never found any other bodies. Detectives first thought that the couple had sent the little boy off and that he had fallen into the pond and drowned. However, the coroner's exam revealed that the body had a deep cut on the head, which indicated that he had been hit with a blunt object. The examination also revealed that the child had very little water in his lungs, which means that he was likely dead or died very soon after going into the water. It's very unlikely that he died, that he drowned. The police posted a picture of the boy in every newspaper in the Midwest. They also offered a reward of $250 for any information on the identity of the unknown boy. This reward grew to $1,000 and still no one came forward. It seemed the case would close until David Dobrik, the owner of the Liberty Department Store, insisted to the police that he had sold the clothing that the child was wearing in January. But there was no way to determine who actually bought the clothing. See, that goes back to my theory, is that the child may have been killed in a moment of rage of some kind, um... They said the child's body did not appear to have been abused over a period of time, and he didn't appear to be malnourished. So it could have been just a moment of anger that someone struck this child and killed them. And then they went to this store and bought these clothing to put on the child's body as kind of a, you know, burial outfit. Um... If the clothing were bought in January, that would say that that was probably around the time that the child had died. He probably Another break surfaced a few months later when a witness claimed to be able to identify the unknown boy. A Chicago man named J.B. Belson stated that the child was his nephew and the son of his sister, Mrs. G.E. Hormich. Belson explained that his sister's ex-husband had kidnapped the two children and threatened to kill them on several occasions. This seemed promising, but when the police investigated, they verified that both the children were alive and well. So this could not have been his nephew. Defeated, Sheriff Keebler eventually announced that the case would be, would uh, that the child's body would be transported to the cemetery and buried. A woman named Minnie Conrad spearheaded a fundraiser to help with the cost. On March the 14th, 1921, a small white casket was, with the child's body was buried in the Prairie Home Cemetery. Conrad placed a bouquet of flowers on the child's grave every year until her death. There is a strange epilogue to this tragic mystery. In 1949, a medical examiner from Milwaukee named E.L. Thoringer 
theorized that the unknown boy could actually have been the child named Homer LeMay, who had disappeared around the time that the little boy's body was found in the pond. Homer's father was questioned about his son's absence, but the elder LeMay stated that Homer had been adopted by a Chicago couple named Norton in 1921. LeMay claimed that the child had been taken to Argentina and that he later found was sent a clipping from a newspaper alleging that the child had been killed in a car accident there. Police investigated but found no proof of his story. They could find no such couple from Chicago by that name, and they could find no one who had moved or gone to Argentina by that name. They could find no proof of an accident that had occurred where a child had been killed. On May the 16th, 1949, Dr. Theringer held a press conference. The body would be exhumed. However, the coroner, Alvin H. Johnson, made the final decision, and they ultimately decided to let the little child rest in peace. But they said that the, bo the, the child's body was found they believe the child could have been in the water. Some theorize that he could have been in the water for up to six months, while others said it wasn't that long. And a local merchant came forward and said, I sold an outfit exactly like the one the child was wearing not too long before the child's body was found. Some people theorize and believe that the reason that they didn't discover the child's body right away was because the the ice had uh, the child had gone into the water, and that the what the lake or the quarry had frozen due to the cold weather. And that once the um, water began to thaw out, the child's body came up to the top. Now, that's a theory. Newspaper article here, and this was dated. 1949. So see, this wasn't until years after this child. And I'm just going to read from this. This is from Anset. This is from the website newspapers.com. Police will quiz LeMay again on the death of the child that they deemed little Lord Fauntleroy. Questioning of Edmund LeMay about the 1921 murder of little Lord Fauntleroy will continue. While Keisha County authorities announced today. The Milwaukeean was quizzed by local authorities for several hours Saturday night and early Sunday morning. Waukesha County authorities questioned LeMay about the disappearance of his son, Homer. District Attorney David Dancy revealed that LeMay was detained for questioning by the Sheriff's Department and was then released. LeMay's attorneys agreed for him to come back for more questioning. Dancy said another session is scheduled. Authorities believe or are probing the possibility that Homer LeMay may be linked with the mysterious death of little Lord Fauntleroy. After the child was pulled from the water, he was held for identification for six weeks before being buried. Today, LeMay said he appeared voluntarily for questioning. He added he may return for more quizzing if he's requested to do so. Dancy said LeMay did not appear voluntarily but had been taken into custody at 9 p.m. and released at 1 a.m. Sunday morning. LeMay has told Milwaukee police that he placed Homer in the care of a Chicago couple named Norton in 1921. He said they took the boy to Argentina and later received a clipping from them that the boy had been killed in an auto accident that same year. A subsequent investigation in South America failed to turn up any evidence to, co to substantiate LeMay's story. Recently, Milwaukee County Medical Examiner suggested that the body of the boy be exhumed for further identification. So far, as far as I know, they did not do that.
But now today, 103 years after the child's death, I think it would be pretty easy to, to exhume the child's body if there's enough DNA that they can exhume and um, compare it to living relatives down the line of this LeMay family. So in this fine degree, this person writes, it's likely that this boy was the son of home. It was, it's likely that this boy is Homer Henry LeMay. His mother's name was Hazel, Hazel Case LeMay, and she died in 1919. It's believed that his father killed him and also killed his mother, tried to murder his second wife, Ruby, and killed his third wife, Cecilia, and her body was never found. Now, there's another link that jumps ahead to another story about a skull that was found that was believed to have been 50 to 60 years deceased, and it was a female skull. And to this day, as far as I know, they've not been able to identify that person's identity. But many people believe that this is this man's third wife. He had several siblings, so they probably had children of their own, and those, child, those people probably had children. This was, like I said earlier, this was how they discovered the identity of the boy in the box so many years later. Now, in, in the name of story, this is about the skull that was found. The skull was found January the 20th, 2017. It's estimated to have, the person's estimated uh, to have been be uh, between 30 years of age, over 30 years, at least 30 years of age. The unidentified human skull was discovered during the excavation for the foundation of a home being built. The anthropological assessment was completed and determined the post-mortem to have been several decades, and the sex is female. Um, there was no torso or limbs or anything like that, just, you know, discovered just the skull. So... A lot of people are speculating that this was in the same area that the third wife, Cecilia, went missing. Now, do they know for a fact that the child's mother, um, the first wife, do they have? Did they have her body? She died. How did she die? What were the circumstances of her death? And what do people know about this murder attempt on the second wife? I've tried to find as much as I can on that. Like I said, I'm going to continue to search because I want to come up with any more details that I can. Why he would have killed the child, I don't know. Unless he just wanted rid of his entire family very much like Chris Watts. He he remarried to this other woman. Is it possible that he killed the, the woman and the child, got rid of their bodies, and married number two, the second wife? Now, this is about Cecilia. On June the 16th, 1948, a woman named Cecilia LeMay disappeared from her home in Wisconsin. She was the third wife of a man named Edmund LeMay, and the two had been married for five years when she went missing. Before her disappearance, Cecilia had planned to move to Newark, New Jersey with her husband as he had gotten a new job there with better pay. Now this leads us to the link that takes us to the skull being found. Wauwatosa, Wauwatosa Backyard remains much of its mystery. That's according to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification, which took a good long look at what used to be somebody's head. The experts don't know who this person is. After careful analysis, 
The only thing they are sure about is that the, the skull is female, that they range the age to be after 30 years of age. It doesn't tell what the cause of death was. There's no other bones discovered, even though they did a, a search and they sifted through the dirt and everything. They found nothing else. The skull yielded a DNA profile, but it lacks the short repeated sequences that help with human identification or mitochondrial profile. Um, it's limited as a searching tool. On January the 20th of 2017, while digging a basement for a new house on Underwood Avenue, workers found the skull. The skull was shipped via UPS to the forensic lab in Texas. The skull returned to Milwaukee Medical Examiner's Office and now sits in a taped up box in an evidence room. The jaw and teeth are missing and the right eye socket is mangled. They are trying to get a DNA match is what they're trying to do. Right now would be the time or, or during this discovery if they believe there could possibly be a link between. But then again, if this was Cecilia, he was not. she was not the child's mother. So there would be no DNA link there. I don't know anything about the child's mother and if she had siblings and they had children throughout the years, cousins, and DNA could match and provide, you know, if this child in the in the grave in Wisconsin is this woman's child. And there really wasn't a whole lot else that I could find. I mean, there's quite a few stories on him. There's quite a few YouTube videos on, on this subject, but it's theories and until they exhume the child's body and try to get DNA put it out there into some databases and try to find a match but as I was speaking to some people on web sleuths about this I said that my curiosity went to the father and his history with these women and what was going on there was he ever charged with anything other than forgery? I'm going to continue to look into him and see what else I could find. And that was really all I could, you know, that was just this, it, it took this kind of bizarre turn. It's possible that he did kill the child and throw him in the water and never told anybody. He may have told his own family this bizarre story that he put the child up for adoption once the child's mother was deceased. But people on Web Sleuths and on Find a Grave say that he killed her. Um, my curiosity went to facts and details about that, and I couldn't find any. The child's body remains buried in the Prairie Home Cemetery under a simple tombstone that reads, Unknown Boy with the date March 8th, 1921. Um, so, this is all I've been able to find about this right now. I'm going to keep looking, see if I can find any more updates. And if it's possible that the, um, you know, cold case people may be out there deciding to exhume the body now in order to do DNA and put that into databases to see if there's anyone out there who has a relation to this child. And maybe his identity can be revealed the way that the boy in the box who had been unknown for 65 years and in 2023 his identity was revealed through DNA. Thanks for watching.